everyone, so today's video is going to be all about how to instantly write better prose using stronger verbs. They're like my favorite part of writing. I just get very excited over verbs. So some of the information in this video comes from a class that I took last year. Some of it comes from a conversation I had with my sister Sarah, so I'm giving credit where credit is due. And some of it is just some personal reflection on verbs. Specifically, we're going to be talking about default lexicon. So this is a term that I learned last year. And so what is default lexicon? So default lexicon is the expected word choice. It's an album of words we know naturally pair together. So most nouns have a default lexicon. For example, leaves fall, the sun shines, the rain soaked. Now I'm just putting it out there. You don't always need to use very specific verbs. And in instances, it'll be better if you don't. I will just go over them very briefly. Obviously you don't want to convolute your prose in unnecessary ways by adding confusing verbs everywhere. I'm guilty of this. I use verbs like they're not verbs because I love them and no one can take them away from me. But in some instances, I have to pack up my really weird verbs because it just detracts from the sentence. So that'll be more of a judgment call. But this video is more on the positive of uh, specific verb use. So back to the problem with expected verb. Basically, expected words do not excite the prose or speak to the writer's style. Any writer can write the snow shines with sun but what if the snow griddles with sun? This is an example from my own book. I just wrote that one. I was pretty happy with it. So when you're picking verbs, you don't want to choose verbs that halt the prose in any way. Whether that's an energy, flow, musicality. Words like this are more forgettable and invisible on the page, like words such as said. And so a reader can more easily skim over them. And if prose is something that you are trying to improve, verbs are actually a really great way to start. Choosing words that spring on the page and work hard for their spot is a really great way to enhance your pro style. So what can you do about it? My biggest tip is to be in control of your word choice. Obviously, this is a really lofty statement, so I will get into some examples. Now that you're aware of what the default lexicon is, watch out for it whenever you're writing to see, hey, am I pairing this noun with its default verb? And if so, are there any places where those default verbs can be replaced with a more creative verb? So what's the deal with good verbs? Why am I so excited over verbs? A strong verb can do so much for your prose. Good verbs, I believe, are the crux of good writing. Good verbs can add a lot more interest in the active parts of a sentence or a scene. They're also a great mode of characterization and voice and can also elevate your images. So first of all, let's start with verbs as image. Stronger verbs specify images. And if you've been on my channel long enough, you know that I'm a bit of a hoe for specificity. I love specificity and for good reason. And that's because I learned that specificity is authenticity. To elaborate on that, specificity is where writing becomes universal because it says this image is this particular thing and nothing else. Therefore, it enables the reader to picture exactly what you as the writer are intending and intention is a whole other thing in writing. But for the sake of this video, the TLDR is intention in my opinion is really important if you're trying to tighten your pro style. Strong verbs can also amplify the images you already have by adding context or associations that you can then apply to a new image in the most succinct way possible. So strong verbs may combine two established images to form your main image, but only in one word. An example of that comes from a short story called Butter Tea at Starbucks by Sharon Bela, and it's in the opening paragraph. So the example is, the flames flap with a noise like laundry on a line. The fire is an orange column a plastic bag pirouettes in midair. So here, Bela utilizes the very imagistic verb pirouettes. What I mean by imagistic is that there is a very specific image related to the word pirouette. So when I say the word pirouette, you're seeing exactly that, somebody doing a pirouette. If you do choose a verb that has a strong image association, a reader may meld the verb's associated image, which would be dancing with the working image, which is the plastic bag flapping in the air. But in one verb alone, two images become a master image. So this, I think, is a lot more engaging as opposed to saying the bag floated or the bag drifted. But that's not all a verb can do. Let's get into verbs as tighteners. Strong verbs are a really great way to avoid adverbs, as I mentioned before. So instead of saying she walked slowly behind me, you can say she lagged behind me. Verbs don't take up much space on the page because they're just one word in opposition to a simile or a metaphor, which is why, in my opinion, they're a great way to 
add subtle nods to theme, as well as add depth to a sentence. If you tend to overuse similes, you can actually just use a stronger verb that has a strong image association that will kind of stand in as a simile, and that'll make more sense as I get into an example. So what if we didn't have the stronger verb in this particular example? It would read, the plastic bag drifted in the air like a dancer pirouetting, versus a plastic bag pirouettes in midair. Both work, but the original, which is a plastic bag pirouettes in midair with that much stronger verb, is a lot more concise. The other version that I constructed uses a simile. Stronger verbs are a great way to combat higher word count as they use fewer words, therefore making the prose a lot more concise. Now let's talk about verbs as tone and voice. Verbs are a succinct way to reveal tone. This is because certain verbs, like any other word, have certain associations or connotations. For example, the word Angry obviously has a negative connotation, so if you had a whole bunch of angry words in one paragraph, like angry, fury, all in one sentence, you would understand because of the negative associations of those words that the sentence is supposed to be angry in tone. So for example, the sun dozed conjures a dreamy image, whereas the sun impaled is a lot more violent. Making sure the verbs you choose fit the language environment of your story can help in establishing a consistent tone. What is a language environment? I don't know if this term actually exists. A language environment is language that is tonally similar and that serves the overall atmosphere of the work. For example, a story about a gardener may use a lot of plant-based or gardening verbs such as rake, till, sprout, and so on. Choosing verbs that are consistent in your story's language environment can also increase your character's voice. For example, going back to the gardener example, a gardener who uses a lot of language subconsciously that relates to their passion, which is gardening, such as, like I mentioned, rake or till, will trigger to the reader, hey, this person is a gardener and they really like gardening. The same can be said for or if your character is a chef, you can use a lot more chefy verbs <laughs> in place of gardening verbs just so you can convey, hey, this character is a chef. That's one of my favorite ways, especially when I'm working with occupation, like in short fiction, to establish voice really early on. Weave it through the language. Voice doesn't have to be like an active stringing of sentences like snark, for example. Voice can all be in how the prose is laid out, what details you choose, the adjectives, the verbs, and so on. So now let's get into some examples on verbs and subverting verbs. And this is actually an exercise I did with my prof in the lecture. It was like 200 kids and it was so fun. Basically, my professor had a list of nouns. So on the left was the noun and on the right was the default lexicon, the default verb. As a class, she was like, we are going to take these default verbs and we're just going to write a new list of like subverted verbs. What are some more interesting defamiliar verbs that we can sub instead of using the default lexicon? So the example that I'm going to give you was so good. Props to my classmate who came up with this one. She had the noun guillotine and the default lexicon was chop, behead, stuff like that. And then one of my classmates, when they were volunteering a stronger verb, suggested widow. So instead of saying the guillotine chops, the line would be the guillotine widows, which this was in the context of poetry. So that is a stunning poetic line, but you can see a guillotine Obviously chopping someone's head off is horrific, but if a guillotine widows, you're giving a lot of context. Now you have a whole story in just one word. This guillotine is widowing. So that means it's taking a partner away from somebody else. And so you have so much more context. It's way richer and has a lot more depth than just the guillotine chops. So that's just an example. I'm gonna run through my examples with you and I've ranked them from the most normal to the most experimental. I'm very experimental with my verbs. People are gonna be on either end of the spectrum. I happen to be on the I love verbs and I would die for my verbs. This is the hill I die on, I love weird verbs. So the first example is going to be the bowling ball rolled toward the pins. So rolled in this instance is the verb, bowling ball is the noun. This is not a bad sentence by any means, but if I was trying to edit it during revision just to make it a little punchier, I could say the bowling ball trundled toward the pins. Trundled is like a synonym for rolled, but it's a bit more interesting on the page. It looks nicer, it sounds a little bit nicer, at least in my opinion, and both sight on the page, obviously, and then sound on the ear is very important when it comes to writing. For me, it's all in the musicality, so that might be an option you consider. So this is just a basic case of I found 
a synonym that was a bit stronger than the verb that I had previously. And that is totally a viable option for if you are trying to find stronger verbs. So the next example is the leaves fall on the grass. I came up with the leaves season the grass. And I thought this one was pretty cool and I will definitely use this in my own work. But instead of the leaves merely just falling to the ground, which is what we expect, it's been written like 10,000 times by now, the leaves seasoning the grass is a bit more interesting. So you have a plane of grass and leaves are falling down and seasoning it like specks of coarse black pepper, which I think is quite interesting in comparison to the leaves fall. So the next example is rain soaked my bare toes. And this is my sister's example and she subverted it to rain blotted my bare toes. Obviously it's not the same as rain like dripping on somebody's feet. Instead the rain is blotting the toes. So perhaps it's coming from drizzle outside. And I really like the verb blotted. I think it's a really pretty verb. The next example is the snow shines in the sun. So shines is the expected verb. Snow is the noun. Like I said at the beginning of the video, I've subverted this to the snow griddles with sun. This is just something I came up with in a writing sprint. It's a little weird, but I like it. That's a bit more of a less familiar way to describe the sun shining on the sun. What does that look like? I said, it looks like it's griddling with sun. The next example is the stream flowed between the rocks. This is also from my novel Feeding Habits. I subverted it in my book to the stream trilled between the rocks. That is one that I came up with on the spot. The more that you practice writing with stronger verbs, the more your repertoire of verbs is going to increase and the better verbs you're gonna be able to pick without like having to edit them back in. But that's not something you have to worry about. It comes in practice. To trill, um, I used to play the flute. There's obviously a technique in when you're a flautist. Obviously I haven't played the flute in so long where you could like trill a note and it's kind of like this wavering, like a vibrato almost. I think I I've used vibrato as a verb as well. I love making up verbs. There is no limit when you can make up verbs, but I use trilled to describe the way the water's kind of like essing its way through the rocks. And there I go making up another verb as I'm giving you an example, essing. The final example for this video is a little weird. This is also from Feeding Habits. So instead of writing his limbs shook in the waves, I wrote his limbs tremoloed in the waves. So tremolo is like a kind of like wavering effect. And I made it a verb. So that one's pretty weird. I think it works in the voice of feeding habits. So that's why I included it. But those are just a few examples on how you can strengthen your verbs and why strengthening your verbs is something you might want to do in your prose. Like I said, you don't have to replace every single verb. I've absolutely had moments where I go overboard on the verbs. So it's really like practice on how to get a balance of what verb really does need to be tightened, what verb doesn't. Um, and those are questions you just have to ask yourself as you're revising um, and something that you will get better at answering as you get more practice. But I hope this video was helpful. I had a lot of fun geeking out about verbs. What are some of your favorite verbs? I love spooled. I have a whole list. Hemmed, ugh, I love hemmed. Drop your favorite verb in the comments below and let me know how you would have subverted some of the verbs that I had in the examples. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one. Bye. And so what is default lexicon? What is it? I don't know. <laughs> 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 <laughs>